this is episode 51 of the Life in Norway show. Today I'm joined by Kate Mills, a contestant from the seventh season of Alt for Norge. This show for Norwegian Americans exploring their Norwegian roots put a new spin on reality TV during its 10 season run. While now over, we take a look back at the show through the lens of a former contestant. You can find out more about today's show, including links to everything we talk about, on the show notes page. Head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 51. Happy listening. I'm joined today by Kate Mills from Washington State, USA. Kate, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Now, you work today up in the uh, Pacific Northwest as uh, as an educator, but that's not the reason we're talking today. The reason is uh, a few years ago you took part in Altfanoga, which uh, people within Norway may or may not have heard of the TV show. Uh, why don't you first of all tell us about the show? Uh, what is Altfanoga or what was Altfanoga, I should say? Yeah, Alt for Norge is a Norwegian reality TV show that features Norwegian Americans, so Americans of Norwegian descent, and they travel all over Norway learning about Norway's culture and traditions while doing individual and group competitions. And the ultimate prize at the end of this series is a family reunion with the relatives that they've located. So in some people's cases, like mine, you had no idea you had any living relatives in Norway, and so you're competing to meet those people first time. Now, you took part in season seven. Uh, had you seen any of the previous seasons? Is that why you wanted to to take part? Yeah, I had never heard of Alt for Norga until a friend shared with me that they were going to be doing some auditions in Seattle. So, of course, I looked up on YouTube. I looked up what it was. I kind of read about it. And as soon as I saw a couple clips of people participating in some of the events that the show puts on, I knew I had to audition. I had to go. (laughs) It it has a different name in in the US. Is that right? It's uh, the Norwegian, Great Norwegian Adventure or something like that? Yeah, I think it translates to everything for Norway. Yeah, the Great Norwegian Adventure. Although not many people here even know about it unless they know someone who's a Norwegian American or like me who've been on the show and they share about it. Yeah. yeah. We're constantly uh, teaching people how to say alt for Norge. Yeah. We course. get a lot of alt for Norge. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a friend of yours that suggested or, or told you about the auditions, but what, uh, what made you want to audition? What is your connection to, to Norway and, and wh- wh- why is it that you identify as a Norwegian American? Mm-hmm. I grew up in a suburb of Seattle called Ballard, and Ballard is a Scandinavian town. Our local grocery store has every Nordic flag outside. We have the largest uh, Sittenamai celebration outside of, you know, Bergen and Oslo, Norway, in the United States. And I grew up there, and my mom's parents, both of them, immigrated from Norway, and they met here in the United States. And I always knew that I was Norwegian. We had Norwegian things around our home, and I grew up in this Norwegian town. Um, But I lost my mom when I was young from cancer. And when my mom passed away, I lost a lot of that connection. I lost, you know, the stories, more information about my great-grandparents, where in Norway they came from, Um, I had done some piecing together, some sleuthing um, through an old Bible I found, you know, things like that. And all I knew from a little note that I found in a Bible was that the word Rissa Norway came up. So I had a location. And when I saw this show, and one of the first clips I saw was of somebody, you know, walking down this dirt road, and she's looking up and seeing this old home, this beautiful countryside of Norway, and she's opening a letter. And the letter is a description of this used to be your family farm, your great grandfather. And I just was hit to the gut that that person is finding their roots. They're finding where their family was from. And I thought I've never had an opportunity. The closest I've ever gotten is just Googling like how to make Norwegian foods. And I was having this deep desire to know more about that, especially having two daughters of my own. And I 
had this um, urge to just find out more so that I could teach them and kind of close that gap, you know, that I didn't get with my mother. So as soon as I saw the premise of the show, I wondered immediately, like, do I have any family members alive in Norway? I have no idea. And I, I just felt that urge to audition because I, I didn't know what my where my great grandparents really came from or what they left behind, if any family members at all. What was the selection process like? The auditioning? Uh, I imagine if you were if this was taking place in in Seattle, it was the competition was pretty fierce. Well, you know, you signed up for a slot, and you, um, in Seattle, I drove down to Seattle, which Bellingham, where I live, is about an hour and a half away. So my husband immediately said, "Yes, you have to do it. We're going to go. We're all going to go. We're going to drive you there." I didn't know what this audition was going to be like, and I've auditioned for other things before. So I packed a bag of some of my Norwegian music because I'm in a Scandinavian choir for fun here. So I thought maybe they'll want me to sing something. I packed my tap shoes, thinking I'll show off some of my tap dancing talents. I didn't know. And really what it was is there took four of us. They uh, had us come in and sit down next to each other. They had a little camera on a table. And they gave us each basically 60 seconds to just state our why. Why do you want to be on this show? And I was the first seat. And I I just sat there and I just pointed a camera and I, I just kind of let it pour out. Like told them about my mom. I told them about my grandparents. Told them about my, my daughters. And just I need to be on the show. Uh, I did do a little something extra, though. I did create a brochure. I created a trifold color brochure with pictures of me and like what I do and as a teacher and uh, all the things I do for fun and kind of like a little blurb about like a travel, like, <laughs> like a travel brochure. Like, here's why you should pick me. And I slipped it in with my paper that I handed them. And they thought that was really funny. And you, then you left. It was like 60 seconds. I drove an hour and a half. It wasn't very long. But from there, I got an email and they said, our producers are interested in you. Can you make a video? Can you make a five minute video? At which point I kind of took them around my house, took them around Bellingham and showcased. They just wanted to see what is your life like? They didn't want anything fancy. They didn't care if it was a good production, like, you know, editing. They just wanted to see what's a day in your life like. So I sent that off to them. And then I got a call. Then the next step is they take you to Chicago. And so what happens is a few months later, and it's a long wait, you don't know anything. They fly you to Chicago where the Norwegian producers have also come into town. And now you're doing an interview with the Norwegian producers in front of a camera and they're taking your photo and they basically leave, they have you leave thinking you're going to hear from them in a couple weeks. And I don't know how many people total have auditioned for the show. I think in, in whole, several hundred, at least 500 to 600 people. From that, I think only about 40 go to Chicago. So to get an idea about how they whittle it down, that's kind of how that worked. And uh, I got a, I got an email a few days later when I got back from Chicago that said um, the producers forgot to ask a couple questions. They want to do a Skype video call with you. I was in my classroom because I was teaching fifth grade at that time. And it was an 8 a.m. call because of the time difference, you know, and they said, okay, we just wanted to ask you about how we didn't ask you about your daughters. How would you handle leaving your girls? We forgot to ask you that. And my response was a uh, previous person who had been on the show, Todd had written letters to his kids every day. And I said, I'm going to do that. So if I go, I, I'm going to do that. So they know that I'm with them. And they said, well, you better go get some stationery because you're going to Norway. Oh, and fantastic. it was like a surprise bombard, like, oh my gosh. And also you can't tell anybody. Nobody had kn known I'd gone to Chicago. Nobody okay. knew. And then I had to go like start my day teaching. I had to go pick up my students and just be like sitting with this information that I'm going to leave in a month for Norway. And my mind was just exploded. Yeah. So w were you able to tell anybody in that, in that month before you went? How did that work? My immediate family knew. And then in, in contact with the show, as I got closer, obviously, I talked to them about letting my work know. I had to make a plan. Um, and mm. as a teacher, I had to line up a sub. We, we would finish school in June, and I was leaving for alt Fenarga the end of April. So it was going to be, it, it, you know, it was interesting with my work because I had to tell them, I could be gone for two weeks or I could be gone for the rest of the year. It, I had no idea how long I would be on the show. So I just had to take a leave of absence. So basically 
leave without pay and go. And it was worth it because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I, I could tell them, um, I, I'm part of the Daughters of Norway, which is an organization here in the United States that is a sisterhood of women with all different Nordic country heritage. Anyhow, I had let them know like, oh, I auditioned for this TV show. Some of you might have heard for, of it. And they kept asking, they kept asking. And I couldn't tell them when I knew I was going to Chicago. But about a, a week or two before, I could tell them, hey, you can't post it on social media, but I'm leaving and I'm going. So I'll be gone. And they were just thrilled. <laughs> Those ladies were so pumped for me. Yeah. So a few people here and there. Um, but that was it. Nobody else. So let's talk about the show itself. Uh, you mentioned already it's a reality show, but for me, it's not really like any other reality show. Uh, it's, you know, it's not like The Voice or anything like that. This is, well, what, let's hear from you. What sort of tasks uh, were you were you set on the show, and, and just how does it work structurally? The show when I was on when I was on anyhow, um, each week had sort of a theme. So they would really want to teach us. Here's this thing we want to teach you about Norway. Here's here's something that we do, or here's something a tradition that we we do. And so the the every week had sort of a theme, and basically we would be traveling someplace and we would do a group competition that involved really crazy things or really silly things, and then. Um, the group that won was safe for the week. The group that lost had to go on to an individual competition, at which point they're doing another competition that could be totally silly and crazy, right? So that's the general idea. And the person who lost that one would go home. So for example, one week, it was it was the week in the woods. And we were in Norway. We, we had traveled to Ondalsnes and we had driven... And so the first part of that episode was us driving down Trollstegen and in a really old, old rickety bus that felt like it was going to fall off the edge of that mountain at any moment, at which point we were then camping um, in literally in the woods and we were learning about trolls. We were learning about the Norwegian troll. And so one of our competition was hunting for Christians, right? Because that's <laughs> one of the stories of the trolls. And we were a three headed troll because we were told the story about, okay, they have three heads. One is for seeing, one is for smelling, one is for eating, you know? And so one of you is going to be the eyeball. So the other two are blindfolded. And then they basically hung cookies all through the forest. And some of them, they dripped with like Japanese fish sauce, which smelled awful. Those were the ones that were considered Christians, right? So that's an example, like just totally outrageous, silly things that people watching the show would be dying laughing. And in the moment, we're just having a ball. But also, there's this sense of like, we have to win this. We have to win this because we want to meet our families and we want to stay. <laughs> so it's so silly. And yet the competition is intense uh, throughout. So something I like about the tasks is they I don't know if this is planned for by the producers, but there's a, a nice mix so that people who uh, know more Norwegian than others, for example, they're good at certain tasks, but then the next week there might be a physical task or a, or a mental task that's nothing to do with the language. And so there's a nice mix of tasks. There's sort of something for everyone. Uh, so with that in mind, which was your favorite? Which one did you enjoy the most? Well, I always got nervous with physical tasks because I never knew if I was going to be strong enough or especially if it was a team or group activity. You know, you don't want to be the one that is the weakest. And and yet I always thrived with the more verbal or more like knowledgeable tasks because I felt like I had learned a lot of Norwegian to, for myself anyway before I left. Right. So I knew and I kind of would study a lot and I took it very seriously. And so one thing that's really interesting when we got there is, and even before we left for the show, they gave strict instructions that you, you are not to be learning Norwegian before you come. So if you've been uh -huh. doing Norwegian classes, stop it right now. If you've been doing Duolingo apps and whatever, no more. And so that was really tra challenging because I thought I'm going to study hard before I come sure. and really know. And they said, nope, stop that. So I did. Once we got there, though, they were they said, if you went to a bookstore and got a Norwegian book, we can't stop you. You can do that. So uh, that that's one thing I did for sure is I got some books as soon as I got to Norway. The other thing that's interesting, too, is when, for example, those 
um, I really loved the knowledgeable ones because I kind of felt like I knew what was coming because what they would do was, and Free Jeff would show up and he would kind of talk to the group. Hello and welcome to, you know, a week in the woods or we're learning about 17th of May this week or whatever. And he would throw out some key words, some Norwegian words like this is a Norwegian word and it means this and we use it for this. And, you know, this is how we use it. And then we would break in filming and we would be doing like individual interviews. And the rest of us, I used to keep a little notepad and pen in my pocket because I would pull it out and take notes because later the rest of us would compare notes. Okay. What did free Jeff say? He said this, and that means this. And where, where, where are we located? And uh, you just, you didn't know what kind of information. So you felt like you could study if that makes sense. And then if there was a quiz, you felt more prepared, Um, but they were very strict with making sure that things were equal. Right. So at the end um, we couldn't have, if we were waiting for a team, for example, to compete, so team red teams competing. The rest of us are sitting and doing nothing. We couldn't have books. We couldn't have paper. We couldn't have pens. And we couldn't talk to each other. We couldn't do anything that might make your team have an advantage over the other team. And that was not something I was prepared for. All the waiting, so much waiting and doing nothing. <laughs> so the physical tasks you you didn't enjoy um which, which ones were were you keen on the more language focused ones or maybe the food i know that there's a competition in episode nine where i'm competing against um johnny and um i'm competing against tom and i'm competing against jeff so i've got these three guys and part of this competition is a knowledge piece it's the language piece that we were given like we each get got 15 minutes to study you know, all these things. And I felt okay with that part, but it was paired with eating and running, you know, running station to station and stuffing your face with a, a waffle and Brunost and chugging <laughs> a cup of coffee. Which we, then, I must say, we, we do this on a daily basis in Norway. <laughs> so yeah, I see why you had, you had to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you're running cabin to cabin at a, a campground. <laughs> chugging coffee and drinking waffles which by the way i love waffles i make the heart-shaped waffles all the time i love brunos but then i couldn't eat those things for weeks after this competition so you had to run and and i know you know when you eat brunos it sticks in your it's not like it goes down easily it's thick and it's sticky (laughs) so you're then pairing that with the knowledge piece and so in that competition i thought okay, can I eat as much as them? Can I eat as fast as these guys can? I mean, these guys can just pop that food in and and that's what I was worried about. But what saved me there was my knowledge piece. I knew all the right answers. I knew them easily. And once I saw the answers, I knew exactly what it was. And I hung, I hung, I I was able to hang tough with those guys. Excellent. (laughs) So, yeah. So each episode or each week uh, is filmed in a different part of Norway. Uh, so you got to see a lot of the country and probably you've seen a lot more of Norway than many people who are actually living mm-hmm. here have seen. Uh, what was the most memorable place you visited? I Hands down, my, going to my family farm, which I did get to do. Uh, that was super special because we were not guaranteed that. You know, When we started filming this show, they made it really clear to all of us that some people may be able to we might be filming some people at their family farms, but it is not a a guarantee. Not everyone gets to do that. So we never really knew who was getting that experience. They always surprised you with that. Um, So that, but, but that aside, right? Like obviously my family farm, but that aside, one of the most memorable places I went to was uh, Hamnimberg and Varda at the very tippy top of Norway. We had to drive down a tunnel to get there. And, it's the most eastern point, I think, in Norway, little island. I think people travel there for maybe bird watching, but the place looks like a ghost town. I mean, it's incredible. You walk in, you're walking around, and it looks like people were there one day and they left. And yet these incredible street artists go there and they paint the walls of these buildings. And it's everywhere. It's beautiful. Um, but also we were there in May and it was light out all night long, which was also very interesting. But uh, that that was a different kind of feeling being up there. It was a different world and Norwegian landscape 
but also you're by the beach. So there's like snow, but you're also by the beach, which felt weird for me being in the Pacific Northwest. We would never probably see the snow right by the water. So that was interesting. Um, and just a rocky terrain. There were no trees. There are no trees up there, which is also very different than the other parts of Norway. Um, but I really enjoyed being up there. It was that I would have never gone there in a million years. That's really interesting. I, I too, um, I have a fondness for the North and I'm, I'm not sure why I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think you've captured some of the reasons there. You mentioned your family farm, uh, which as we were discussing before I hit record is, is in Trondelag here in central Norway, not far from where I'm sitting now, just across the fjord. Um, you also got to wear the Trondabunad uh, mm-hmm. during the show, the, the national dress. Uh, how was that experience for you? That was one of the most amazing moments in my life. I had learned about Sutnamai and Bunads a, a couple of years before I even went on Old for Norga. It was one of the ways that I was able to research like, oh, I heard about these dresses. I wanted one. I was like, where do you buy those at the store? I saw someone wearing one at a, a Norwegian fair and I said, where can I get that? And they looked at me kind of like, you can't just go buy this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what? And then they said, oh yeah, they're different for every region. And the only thing I knew about my roots was that region. And so I looked that up. So I had seen pictures of this dress. I'd seen pictures of what it looks like. Um, so to walk into a building and have this dress hanging there with my name on it, with a note saying, this is your bunad from where you come from, where your family comes from, you get to wear this. That was the most amazing feeling. And to wear that dress on the 17th of May in Norway to see a parade and and just be feeling that moment. I felt more connected with my Norwegian roots, knowing the special, um, just the, how special it is to wear that kind of dress. You know, I know not everybody, those things are expensive and they're handmade. And I just, I, I appreciated and valued just the garment I was wearing. And I, I just felt so connected to my family in that moment. You you went far in the show. Uh, you got to wear the Bunards. You got to visit the family farm. Yes. You got to the final uh, show, but yes. you didn't win. You didn't quite get the grand did prize. Not. No. I, but you did a- achieve a lot and experience a lot. How do you feel? Yeah. I mean, f- four or five years on now, disappointed yeah. or or not disappointed at all? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about that moment that last competition every day for several days after, because I only lost by 45 seconds. So I would look back and go, if I had just done that thing a little faster, if I'd moved a little quicker here, if I'd carried that person's body or moved the naked man. And if you are interested in any of the things I'm saying, you should go watch that (laughs) episode. But I honestly, to be honest, I felt really disappointed at first because obviously I'd been working so hard for 10 weeks about, you know, in Norway trying to meet my family. And it came down to a very physical, very physical competition, which of course I've already mentioned, I didn't feel as confident about those, especially when I'm competing against someone who's like two feet taller than me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Now that being said, the show was very fair, you know, nothing about the show. I don't feel like they did anything to make me lose or anything, but I felt really sad at first. Um, but once I got home, I was given information about my family. I was given their names. And even in the, in the episode, that last episode, I had seen, they had sent us all a little video clip from our family. So that was something they had never done before. So I'd seen a couple of my cousins and they were like waving hello. That was huge for me. So I, I reached out to my cousins as soon as I was able to. We weren't allowed to contact them until after a certain date to make sure everybody was home at the same time. And long story short, I communicate regularly with my cousins. My husband and I, we we chat with them daily, almost on Facebook Messenger, on other apps. We have a shared photo album in our Apple and our phones, you know, so when they're going and doing stuff, we see stuff immediately. And I don't regret anything. And and the I think the big takeaway for me was if if I had won the show, for example, you get a family reunion, but it's it's monitored by the show. It's very organized. You know, you're maybe only seeing your family for a couple hours and they're filming. OK, now let's do this and now let's film you eating. And and I didn't get that in that moment. But after a year, uh, my husband and I came back, just the two of us to Norway. 
And I had a reunion with my family that I had been talking to for a year. And we met in person. We spent several days with them in Trondheim. We went to the family farm together that I was filmed at. And we went to the family Hitza. It was just so fun. So I got to experience that. And last fall, before the pandemic hit, my family came here. So oh, my wonderful. cousins from Norway yeah. came to uh, to us and spent some time here in Bellingham. And then, of course, we took them to Seattle and took them to an American football game. So we're close. And I think while I, I'm sad I didn't win and I didn't get that experience on the show, I, I got that experience twofold by just uh, what I wanted from the show was to know who who is it that I'm related to there. And I got that. And what I wanted was connection to my roots. And I absolutely, absolutely got that. They do say it's not the winning, but the taking part that counts. And it sounds yeah. as if that was uh, absolutely true in this case. Wonderful, Kate. Uh, you've talked quite a bit about the behind the scenes already, but I, I do have another couple of questions about that. Um, how much do you know about what is planned? It sounds like not very much. You're just whisked away and you're as soon as the cameras start rolling, that's the moment you find out w what you have to do? Yeah, we really weren't told much. So for example, one of the first nights we were there, we were getting ready to go and they, all we knew is we were going to get ready to go film episode one. And they sat us down and they said, okay, get your notes out. This is the, all the things you're going to pack because when you arrive, they outfit you with everything you might need for any situation. So we got a big duffel bag filled with winter style clothes and rain boots and rain slickers and gloves. I mean, anything and everything. So you couldn't really tell what we were going to do with just that, but they would tell you, this is what you need to bring on this trip. So we wouldn't travel with even all of our things every time. Cause we would go for a few days and come back to Oslo, kind of the home base there. And they said, um, tomorrow we will be traveling West for eight hours. And that was all they would say. Hmm. <laughs> And uh, a couple of us, me and Lars, I know, for example, and maybe Kelsey, we all bought maps. We went to the lo local grocery store and we bought maps and we would just be following signs along the road. We were like, what highway are we on? And we would be making predictions about where we might be ending this. OK, in about eight hours, we might be here and we would get there and get to these beautiful hotels. They always took such great care of us. Um, we have a, a nice meal together and they said, okay, well, we're going to meet, you know, at this time tomorrow to start filming. And that was all we would know. You, you you're going to want to wear maybe something warm or maybe you're going to want to wear your rain boots for this one. And we'd be like, oh no, what are we doing? You know, we never knew. And we would see Freech off and he would come and we would, they would film him really introducing the, what was happening. We never heard. Now, after the initial film, they might do it again from a different angle or they might do something like that. And you'd kind of have to remember like, oh, how did I react the first time? You know, but really everything you see is genuine. It's the first genuine moment. Um, there was some time we, we went to Osgardstrom and we were walking around and they just said, OK, so maybe you're going to walk down this road and turn the corner and maybe you'll see something. <laughs> so, we, so really, we really didn't know what. And sometimes we were so confused. We'd be like, is, is this what we're supposed to be looking at? Is that what we're supposed to be looking at? Like, did you want us to touch that? Did you want us to pick that up? <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we kind of flubbed it a few times because we, they were like, no, silly Americans, just do the thing, you know, <laughs> but we really didn't know uh, ever. We never knew. And same for flying. So like, for example, when we went to uh, Varda, for example, we flew to Shirkinus mm -hmm. and then we drove around that little bay. I don't know what it is. It's a bay or body of water. I mean, we could have just gotten on another flight, just hopped over to where we were going, but they didn't, they took us all the way around. So we really had no idea, but we would just go to the airport and they'd be like, you're going to need to bring your bag to the airport, make sure it's not heavy, too heavy. And we wouldn't know where we were flying until we got there, which is why episode, I think it was six was, uh, so huge because they said, you're, you're going to learn about Sweden and where Norwegians go on vacation. And it, our minds were exploding when they said you have like two hours to pack. You're going to the Canary Islands. And 
I was not happy about that. I was like, I don't want to leave Norway. I'm here to meet my family. I'm here to win. I don't want to leave the country. And if I lose in another country and have to leave and not go to Norway, I just will lose my mind. And so everybody else was so excited. And I, yeah, so we really didn't know. We really, and I thought we, I have winter clothes. I have rain boots. You outfitted me with winter clothes. And I remember running to the Lindex the store, the Lindex (laughs) store. And just like, do you have shorts? Do you have tank tops? Like, I don't have any of this clothing to be in hot weather. You mentioned uh, 17th of May, and you've talked about the summer vacation. How long were you actually in Norway for? So I arrived, I believe it was about April 23rd or 24th or something like that. And I think I ended, I left the, the first week of July, end of June. I think it was the end of June. I don't really remember now, but it was about 10 weeks total. Oh. And every episode took about four days to film. So you could expect four days of filming. Day one is, you know, you're being, you're introduced to the the theme for the week with Freechoff and then a lot of individual interviews. So then they, they have these chunks of time where you're sitting quietly and they pull you over one at a time in front of the camera and they ask questions kind of like what we're doing now. Like, oh, so you 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 said you were scared to try that food. What, what do you think that food is or why? And, you, you know, you're answering questions. And then um, we do a competition. And then the, um, the next day, uh, the next day would be like the big group competition. And then the third day is only interviews. The third day of filming is just individual interviews and they might bring, have you bring like, okay, bring the blue shirt that you wore on day one. We're going to ask you some more questions or bring the red shirt. So you're just doing a 45 minute time interviewing somewhere. And then the last day is the individual competition. So the individuals that lost in the group competition, they're doing an individual. And if you weren't part of that team, you didn't know where they were. You didn't know what they were doing. You were just sitting at the hotel or walking around the local town, whichever we were, wherever we were at. And they'd say, okay, it's time to go. And they would drive us to some discreet location where they had been doing some crazy competition that maybe you wouldn't know what they were doing. And we're just being brought in to watch the final results be shared with them about who's lost and who's going home. And in that moment, when Freechoff is saying, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, you know, Brittany, you're going home. That is our goodbye. They, If you're in that team that lost and you have packed your bags and all of your bags are in the back of a car. Right. And if you're the person that's going home, you're saying goodbye right then and you don't see them again. They take them and they bring them somewhere else. And for someone like me who was in the show the entire time, it was like, where did they go and what did they do? And so after we all came back home and we were all starting to talk to each other, we were like, where did you go? Like, did they go, did you go to a hotel? <laughs> did you leave? Did you go straight to the airport? Like what happened? And everybody had a little bit of a different experience based on where we were located, but um, they, that was really the goodbye. So when you see us hugging our, our, you know, our friends goodbye in that final moment, that's it. They were leaving. That surprises me a little. Uh, I think most people who have watched any reality TV assume there's a certain amount of scripting that has gone on. But to actually know that the goodbye you see on the screen is the real goodbye, that's uh, that's surprising to me. Uh, another yeah. surprise I, I have read about, and I just want to ask you whether this is true or not. Are you really not allowed your mobile phone for the whole time you're in Norway? Not at all. Wow. You are not allowed any outside communication. So you know, at the beginning, when I said that they outfit you with this bag of all the clothes, they took us to this big room and we all had our bags and they were all labeled with our names. And then they said, okay, now cell phones are coming over. And they, they tucked them all in like little soft containers and they packed them away and we never saw them again. And in my case, at the end of the show, I filmed the, the, we filmed the last episode. And I remember we went out for dinner that night and it wasn't until maybe the next day even like the show is done so we're done filming and they gave me my cell phone like the day before my flight was leaving and uh so I had not looked at it or touched it for almost 10 weeks at all and even then we weren't allowed like if there was a hotel or something with a computer we you know we couldn't be on computers we couldn't be no phone calls so I think in episode nine there were some prizes, some of the prizes, like some of the perks was Freechoff said, okay, if there's three little short competitions first, 
And if you win this one, you get a phone call home. Uh You get to call home. And if you win this next one, the next winner of this one, you get a phone call home. And I remember um, I hadn't really thought about calling my family because I had kind of just I needed to just be in there and not think about it as much or else I would have just been I would have been like, just send me home. I got to go home to my girls and my husband. But as soon as he came around the corner and like Grimstad and was like, you're going to win a phone call. I just lost it because Mm. I had not even considered hearing my husband's voice or my girl's voice in that many weeks. You know, they were four and six years old at the time. And I lost. I lost that first one by just a little bit. And I lost the second one just by a little bit. And watching my friends make phone calls home just felt like torture. I just thought, you know, but in hindsight, I wonder, I wonder if I had been able to call home, would it have made me lose my focus? Would I have not been so like driven for the last part there? I don't know. I'll never know. But yeah, we definitely did not get our phones (laughs) the entire time. In 2019, uh, Old Fanoga wrapped up season 10 and it was announced that there would be no more seasons. Maybe that will change in the future. Who knows? But certainly at the time we're recording this, uh, the show is over. So yeah. I can't really ask you to give advice for future contestants. But what I can do, and I, and I know how many of these people there are out there running this website, I get e- emails literally every day from Norwegian mm-hmm. Americans who are looking for information on their their heritage and a certain farm somewhere in Norway and so on. Um, mm-hmm. What advice do you have for them who who are maybe thinking about finding out more, maybe even contemplating a visit? Yeah, one thing I've learned about um, I learned I've learned a lot in the process about how how they kept track of records. And it's really tricky. If you're using something like Ancestry.com, which is where I had started, it's really hard to find things because a lot of our Norwegian ancestors changed their names or tweaked their last names. And and especially like my great grandfather is an example of that. I couldn't find anything because he was listed as Auna and really the farm name was Berg's Auna. So I would have never known that. I think one thing I've heard people have a lot of success with is if you know even just the town or the city, if you can find the parishes, the local parishes and the local churches there keep extensive records of things. And so even just reaching out to them is a really is a really great starting point, I think. Find the parish that your family may have been a part of because they've kept track of baptisms, confirmations, weddings, deaths, births, everything. And I know you can you you can search Norwegian archives and those are really helpful as well, but I think they really only work well for you if you understand how farm names work and locations and things like that. I am part of Daughters of Norway and so I encourage everybody to become part of either Daughters of Norway or Sons of Norway. There's going to be people in those groups who know a lot. And there's a lot of people who are very knowledgeable in genealogy and finding farms. I have a lady in my group alone who's got books and books and books of a name of every farm in all of Norway, and she can help you locate. So finding organizations and groups like that in the U.S. that really are are excited about that. And there is a lot of them, honestly, on Facebook. So if you are on Facebook, you can reach out there. So I, I recommend those are all really good starting places. As far as if you're thinking of going to Norway, I mean, if you know anywhere about where your family was from, then definitely start there. But I honestly don't think there's any bad place in Norway to visit. Look at a map or look at what kind of place you want to visit and go there. I recommend those small. I really enjoyed places like Grimstad, um, for example, because it was a smaller town on the water. It was beautiful, but there's so much history. Osgard's drawn the same thing. I had no idea that Edvard Monk had lived there. So find some nuggets of information about either famous people or famous landmarks and just start there and take a train and just go somewhere else, you know, or get a car and drive there. But there's no bad place to visit in Norway. Kate, thanks so much for sharing uh, your experience with us today. I, I've learned a lot. And, you know, when I first moved to Norway, Old Fenorga was just starting um, the first couple of seasons. And as a foreigner living in, in Norway, even though I'm not American and I don't have Norwegian heritage, it was a great help in processing some of those feelings mm-hmm. and experiences that I was going through. So um, 
Yeah, and it's been fascinating to hear yeah, behind the scenes your experience uh, and how it was to be to be on the show. Uh, you also have a website uh, chronicling your experience, and this is actually how I found you. Uh, and <laughs> on that website is a wonderful little uh, a show reel, I guess, a highlights reel of your experience. So if you are interested in finding out more, I, I highly recommend uh, checking out Kate's website and that video. It's uh, it really wraps everything up nicely. And Kate, your your website address is NorwayKate.com. So pretty Perfect. easy. So yeah. And and you know, just a disclaimer, I put that together right at the end of my when I came back from the trip. I had journaled and wrote every single day everything I was doing because I just wanted to remember every moment. So really that website is just if you want to read my journal post, you really see what it was like behind the scenes. They're all there. But I can guarantee you there's spelling errors and all sorts of things because it was a lot to write down. <laughs> but sure. the highlight reel is a really great short, shortish video to really see what was it like. Here's an idea. And I believe a lot of our, all the seasons, if not most, if not all, are on YouTube right now. They're not always there. Sometimes they get taken down, but um, they are up there. Well, I'll include links to a lot of what we've talked about, including uh, resources for researching your your heritage, uh, links to Kate's website, and uh, I'll have a look on YouTube, see if we can find any any episodes, uh, whole episodes from uh, season seven, which you were in. And uh, you'll be able to find that on uh, lifeinnorway.net slash podcast. Kate, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure to talk with you.